Thank you very much and welcome to this uh, fireside chat. Uh, I'm so happy to join you uh, and to introduce my 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 speaker to this afternoon and thank you uh, Rightscom for this invitation. My name is Beatriz Busaniche. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm the president of Via Libre Foundation, which is an organization here in Latin America working in the field of uh, human rights and technology since year 2000 now. Where we are 21 years old organization and we've been dealing with the issues that we will address in this session uh, together with the Cory Doctor of for a long term now. Um, let me introduce him. Cory Doctor of is a science fiction novelist, a journalist, a technology activist. He's a contributor to many magazines, websites and newspapers. He also works, he's a, a consultant, a special consultant and, and, and a big contributor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is one of our colleagues, organizations, a non-profit civil liberties group that defends freedom in technology law and policy and standards and treaties. And he, and his um, uh, biography is so long that I cannot uh, read it completely, but uh, it's a pleasure to share this moment with you, Corey. Um, he's also the co-founder founded of an uh, open source peer to peer software company, OpenCola. And he's been talking about these issues for more than 20 years, I guess. Uh, um, and of course, this conversation in this fireside chat We'll go around issues that uh, we are very, very interested in, like, for example, big tech concentration, intellectual property, and internet regulations, strategies for dealing with all these issues, dealing with interoperability, and all the challenges and problems and strategies that we have to deal with in the field of uh, human rights and technology. And first, well, welcome, Corey. It's a pleasure to share this session with you. Uh, so the floor is yours. If you want to introduce you or say something sure. I, I didn't say. No, Just, I, that, uh, was a, that was a lovely introduction. Hello, Beatrice. Uh, hello. It's fantastic to finally be at RightsCon. Uh, and uh, a pleasure to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to uh, ranging over these topics with you. I, I know that they're, uh, they touch on your work as well. And we were just talking before we went live about um, both of us having done work in the Latin American region on some of these issues, particularly with uh, with treaties that the U.S. Trade Rep has been uh, very active in, in prom promoting through uh, the Latin American world and not to the benefit of that region. Uh, I think most recently there was the Mexican copyright law that passed last July. Uh, and which we successfully campaigned to have uh, subject to judicial review. So, uh, thank you, Corey. So, the, the first thing I, I would like to talk with you is something that is, uh, well, it's not in the news because it's, it's something that interested uh, most people like us, uh, but I think it's a very interesting thing for Rightscom now, and it's a decision on on the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, last week on Van Buren versus the United States on the CFAA, uh, which I know you are one of the most critical, uh, you, you have a very critical uh, view of this law. And of course, last week when we uh, knew the result of this case, uh, everybody thought on Aaron Schwartz and what would have happened where in this case, uh, when applying this this uh, narrow version of the CFAA, and so I, I would like to start this conversation asking you, what's your first uh, um, sensation? What's your first uh, perspective? Your first view on this uh, Van Buren versus United States case on this uh, interpretation of the CFAA? Well, I, I think there was tremendous relief uh, because the Van Buren. Uh, the, the facts surrounding Van Buren, not the facts about what Van Buren did with the computer system, but who he was and what the context was, made it, made for a very unsympathetic defendant. I mean, one of the things about, about Aaron Swartz's case is that he was a very sympathetic victim of the CFAA. A lot of the times we've seen CFAA law, bad CFAA law advanced because the government and the private actors who invoke it uh, choose their battles, and they they like to pick on people who 
uh, are uncharismatic and whose case is harder to make. But of course, once the precedent is set, then it can be wielded against everyone, not just the not just the people who we wish would be curtailed in their behavior. In this case, Van Buren was a, a police officer who took a bribe to help someone who wanted to find out whether a sex worker whom he was involved with in some kind of uh, nefarious scheme was actually an undercover police officer. And uh, it, you know, those are um, the kinds of facts that I think most of us recoil from and would be delighted to see the, the villain of that story held to account. And so it's hard to argue that we shouldn't distort a law to hold someone who has done something terrible responsible for their actions. And so when the decision came down that held that whatever else Mr. Van Buren or Officer Van Buren, former Officer Van Buren was guilty of, he wasn't a hacker uh, and he hadn't violated a cybersecurity law and that the cybersecurity law that they'd invoked, this 1986 law that Ronald Reagan rushed into law um, <clears throat> after, after watching the movie War Games and having a panic and then letting a bunch of federal prosecutors whisper in his ear that there should be a, a statute against uh, computer intrusion that was so broad that the government could use it just about against anyone, um, that that law didn't didn't and couldn't cover the the specifics of what Van Buren was accused of, which was that he was accused of having a computer that he that he was allowed to access, but using it in ways that he'd been told not to. And this was equated to breaking into a computer that he wasn't allowed to access. And the court very wisely drew a distinction, although they also put in a footnote that said, we're not really drawing this distinction in the way you think we are. That has left everyone who's read that footnote going, well, then exactly what are you doing? And and I I think, unfortunately, it reaffirms the, the widespread perception that uh, lawmakers and judges don't understand technology well enough to regulate it, which I think is um, a very dangerous perception that leaves us kind of in a nihilistic void. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. But my 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 first uh, view on this case was exactly the same. This is uh, someone doing something wrong, uh, but the kind of uh, of regulation that they were using to prosecute him uh, was wrong as well. So it's it's uh, this uh, thinking about a broad interpretation of the law uh, would be very dangerous even while there's there was a lot of people in the in the privacy community that were asking for this interpretation because of privacy issues and and that, that leads us to my my next uh, topic i would like to to address in this conversation is that um what do we do with the issue of privacy when we don't have enough regulations uh but when we are in a situation in in this uh this, this concept that Shoshana Zuboff usually, uh, she, she uh, made this, this concept of the surveillance capitalism. We have to deal with surveillance capitalism, yes, but we have to deal with the right laws. Uh, that's my, my idea as well. And I, I guess we share this, uh, this uh, uh, perspective on that the problem is not only the problem of privacy, but of con concentration, which... Uh, puts the, the second issue I would like to address uh, today is this idea of a concentration and the big tech. How do we regulate this big tech in order to deal with this uh, uh, concentration, uh, especially thinking from the South? Uh, I, as I told you, I'm from Latin America, uh, but when we deal with concentration issues, it's like we can we can't do anything from here because it, it, we are all the time watching out the antitrust authorities in the European Union and in the US. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to get into this topic, which is a really, really complicated topic um, on the, what is uh, the situation right now in this uh, competition uh, investigations in the US and how do you think we could, from the countries, from the South, uh, have a say on this situation that it, it involves us as well? Well, you've raised so many issues. I'm actually making notes on all the different things I want to say. I, I, let's, I, I think productively we could subdivide that question because it's a very good one, but it touched a bunch of different areas. So the first part of your question was about the suitability 
of using non-privacy laws to protect privacy. So I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a really thoroughgoing privacy advocate. I, I'm a strong believer in privacy and, in a, and I oppose surveillance. Um, however, I, I think that in order to address privacy, we need privacy law. And, and I'll give you an example from uh, uh, the early part of this century about, about the failings of a privacy law, of, of a non-privacy solution to a privacy problem. I started to get emails around the year 2003 from people saying, I showed up for our date, but you weren't there. And I said, I don't understand what you mean. And they said, well, I answered your profile on this dating service and we set up a date. So I went and I looked at the dating service and there it was. Someone had set up a profile using my identity. And I, I emailed the dating service and I got something back saying, you know, we, I forget what it was, but we don't deal, deal with that or we'll, we'll consider it or whatever. And in the meantime, I was still getting these replies. So I actually rang them up and they said, oh, we, we actually can ex expedite your problem. All you need to do is claim a copyright on the photo in your profile and we'll take it down. And there were a lot of problems with this. You know, one was that it was a Creative Commons licensed image, <laughs> but another was that there are certainly instances in which people could have their identity stolen, their privacy violated in this way that didn't involve a copyright infringement. And so the the remedy would would be limited to this very narrow subset of of people who had done. Uh, a copyright violation in addition to a privacy violation. And if you care about privacy, you should actually really want there to be a, a fit for purpose sui generis privacy rule. The GDPR uh, it goes pretty far towards it, although it has pretty lax enforcement and there are elements of it that I think are problematic, including right to be forgotten. But at least it, it it frames privacy as a subject unto itself, and it seeks to regulate privacy in that way, rather than, for example, creating a system of expedited content removal that um, would align the interests of people who care about privacy with people who want to accomplish uh, illegitimate censorship. Because, you know, I've had lots and lots of people in my career as a journalist write to me and claim falsely that copyright allowed them to remove criticism of wealthy people or of corrupt corporations. And we want a, a robust protection of speech, per, uh, a re robust regime of speech protections. So it seems to me that the way that you balance those is by having two different rules, a speech protection rule and a privacy rule. And that uh, the privacy rule is the exception to the speech protection rule. And not that we say speech protection is in, in, in contention with privacy. So I think that's my answer to the first part of your question there. And I wanted to get your take on that before we can move on then to surveillance capitalism and market concentration, and then maybe to regional remedies. Well, and you know, I, I'm also worried about intellectual property and, and the uses of intellectual property to, for censorship. Uh, the, here in the region, we, we don't have the same kind of uh, um, regulations as DMCA. For example, here in Argentina and Uruguay and Chile in Brazil, you need a, a, um, a warrant to put something down. So people is using DMCA. So it, uh, the people who want to censor some contents, they use DMCA, which is a foreign regulation to download uh, contents here in the region. So that DMCA also has an impact abroad, the US, uh, because it is the one that regulates all the, the, the major platforms that I have the obligation to comply with the MCA. So we are suffering the MCA here in the South, even while we stopped any initiative to have something like that in 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 our country, at least in Argentina. But um, uh, but uh, I, I think the, the problem on intellectual property is it's part of the main problem. And that that is concentration because intellectual property contributes to concentration. In fact, and, and this is another thing I would like to to ask you, but let's let's move on with the second part of my first questions, and so we don't mix questions, and we we have a, a little bit more order in this conversation because I have a lot of things to ask you. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to move on to surveillance capitalism, 
Uh, and and give the the uh, coiners their due. So before Zuboff used the phrase, uh, some leftist academics published on it uh, out of British Columbia. Uh, Zuboff did popularize it, and she popularized a version that was a little different to theirs. Um, Zuboff is a, a, a business school professor uh, and uh, a very good thinker, and uh, and quite a strong believer in markets. And her criticism of surveillance capitalism is not a critique of capitalism, which the, the, the first people who really used the term used it to critique capitalism itself. Her criticism is more by way of being a, a, a criticism of a flavor or strain of capitalism. She calls surveillance capitalism the rogue capitalism. So I, most of the audience probably knows this, but the theory of markets goes that we have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of people and people want stuff and figuring out who should get which stuff is hard. And so the way that we figure out who should get which stuff is not by putting everyone's wants and needs into a giant computer program and asking it to allocate them. It's by um, having a market that aggregates the decisions of producers and consumers, what you are willing to do for money and what I'm willing to pay to get you to do stuff. And that somehow this creates a kind of self-correcting machine, an invisible hand that creates these efficient allocations. Now, you may or may not believe that, but if you, but, but if you do think that that's true, then Zuboff's problem is that she thinks that the tech companies are telling the truth when they say to people who buy ads that they can use machine learning and uh, big data to override people's critical faculties and get them to do the thing that, that is advertised, buy the thing that's advertised. Uh, and that they created this for commercial purposes, but it's been hijacked for political purposes. So, you know, the way I shorthand that is, you know, Google made a, um, a, a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners, and then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon Nazi, right? And uh, I think that there's a, and so she says that if that's what's going on, right, if, if, if your decisions aren't being made freely by you, but rather dictated by market actors, then the market is no longer aggregating decisions, it's imposing its will. So it's a kind of command economy. And she says that this is self-reinforcing because the companies can then distort policy and distort our choices so that they can gather more data and the more data they have, the better they can control our behavior and the better they control our behavior, the more data they can get out of us, the more favorable policies they can acquire. And for me, the problem with all of this is not that surveillance is bad and not that the companies are too big and not that they don't disturb policy. It's that that belief that although the companies routinely lie about everything, their labor policies, how their ad markets work, whether or not they're surveilling you, how they handle your data, you know, everything that they do <laughs> is a lie, except when they're talking to their customers. And that's the only time they tell the truth. And I think that that is a really implausible position. I think it would be implausible no matter what claim they had made to their customers they were talking about. But when we talk about the ability to bypass our critical faculties, to determine our behavioral outcomes, to control our minds, we should, as recipients of that claim, demand extraordinary evidence. Because everyone who's ever made that claim in the past, right, when the CIA was doing MK Ultra, when Rasputin was convincing the czar, when um, uh, pickup artists were selling each other code words to get women to sleep with each other, when neuro-linguistic programmers were selling you tapes to listen to in your sleep, they were all lying, right? They were all charlatans. Everyone who's ever claimed to be able to do mind control, Ray, was a charlatan. And so if someone is going to make the claim that they finally cracked that nut, right? We should treat it like we treat claims about faster than light travel, zero point energy, room temperature semiconductors, all that, cold fusion, all of that stuff. We should say time, time travel, right? We should say, prove it and prove it in a strong way, right? Not, not by having one study the way Facebook did where they exposed 60 million people to a, psycho a psychological intervention in the hopes of convincing them to turn out to vote and saw a 0.39% effect size. Now it's true that 0.39% of 60 million is a huge number, it's hundreds of thousands of voters, but this was across all precincts, right? So yeah, it's true, if, they, if Facebook could convince your neighbors, 250,000 of your neighbors to turn out and vote in a specific way or just vote period, it would sway elections, 
But that's not what they even claim to do. They claim that they could they could get 0.39% of your neighbors to do that. And your precinct is not so large that 0.39% of them makes a difference, right? That's not that's not the margin. Even very close margins are determined on. That's that's single vote margins in most elections. And so Corey, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, as, as my background is mass communication, so I cannot uh, do oh, yeah, anything, no. but I agree with you oh. on that the, there is no such influence, that direct influence. But uh, do you think this all this propaganda we hear about uh, the platforms being responsible for hate speech or for attacking the capital or for the winning or losing an election or whatever that you you dis already described is somehow a, a way to put a, a put put a, get a, off the this the the deepest problems we have as societies. It's like a, some a kind of resignation to address the real problems. Maybe I, I put myself in a little bit of a, a philosophy with this, sure. but uh, but I, I think it's it's somehow a resignation of dealing with our real problems. It's, okay, let's uh, put Facebook and Google and Twitter as guilty. Let's ask them to solve these problems as they can manage all this situation. So it, do you think it's a resignation from the politicians yeah. from the, the the civil society as well so let me let me tell you that i so here's where i agree with zuboff and disagree with her so i agree with her that the big tech platforms really do control our behavior but not through behavior modification techniques they control our behavior because having data collected on you all the time distorts the way that you think about things right and um having to use facebook in order to talk to your friends because they've blocked interoperability. See, I'm setting us up for our next conversation here because they've blocked interoperability. So they've got everyone there. And so everyone has to join because everyone is there and everyone has to stay there because everyone is there and nobody can leave because everyone is there. You know, that really distorts our, our behavior. Um, if you wanna talk about the ability to uh, control behavioral outcomes, look at Apple. 100% of the apps that Apple customers buy, they buy from Apple. Right? That is a that is a perfect degree of control. That's not a 0.39% effect size, right? That is a 100% effect size. Now, they don't do it by bypassing our critical faculties. They do it by abusing IP law, which is, again, a subject that we're going to come to later, right? So there are these, these gross ways in which they distort our lives, our behavior, but they're not um, accidental, right? They're not, they're not nefarious. They're right out there in plain sight. And a good policy would take account of this and do something about it. Just like a good policy wouldn't let oil companies continue to uh, endanger our planet, just like a good policy wouldn't let uh, employers endanger their workforce. And I think we have to ask ourselves, how come we get bad policy outcomes? And I said before that I think it's dangerous to assume that the reason we have bad technical policy outcomes is that lawmakers and judges don't understand technology. Because if, if you have to understand technology personally to make a good policy about it, then how is it that with no microbiologists in Congress, every American isn't dead of waterborne diseases, right? Clearly it's possible for lawmakers to delegate to expert regulators who can adjudicate among contradictory claims from experts and make a, a finding of fact that turns into policy where the workings are shown and where there's a process by which uh, uh, an outcome can be changed in the light of new evidence and where there are recusals for conflicts of interest and so on. That procedure is uh, incinerated by monopoly. Monopoly turns the procedure by which we determine the best available answer to a complex technical question from a truth-seeking exercise to an auction. And it, it, there's a word for that kind of corrupt, for that kind of outcome and it's corruption. And a synonym for corruption is conspiracy. So when you ask yourself, why do people no longer believe in our institutions? Why do they conspire? Or why do they believe that there are conspiracies to do bad things to children? Why do they believe that there are conspiracies to um, steal elections and so on? It's, it's because they have lived experience of actual conspiracies, non-hypothetical, non-deniable conspiracies. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Anna Merlin called Republic of Lies that looks at the kind of ethnography of conspiracy. 
And it, you know, she says like a conspiracist is not lazy, right? An anti-vaxxer is someone who's very energetic. Because to sustain an anti-vax position, you have to know chapter and verse about actual pharmaceutical malpractice, right? You have to be able to know, for example, that the Sackler family and the, and the other opioid manufacturers really did suborn their regulators to kill hundreds of thousands of people and make billions of dollars, which they smuggled out of the country into tax havens, and which they're going to get to keep, right? And so in the face of that, when someone says to you, vaccines are safe, and you say, well, our basis for knowing that they're safe are claims by the pharmaceutical companies that have been evaluated by regulators and the pharmaceutical companies have shown themselves to be not fit for purpose and the regulators have shown themselves to be biddable. Why should I believe your claims about vaccines? And, you know, they're not wrong. I mean, they're wrong about vaccines. Vaccines are safe. You should get vaccinated, right? <laughs> but they're not wrong that there's a good reason to mistrust our institutions. And so I, I, I think that the problem with Zuboff's analysis is that she doesn't want to ask whether monopolized markets have produced the things that she's worried about, in part because she's very fond of some monopolists. She's, she's a great fan of Apple, and she, she buys into this idea that if you pay for the product, you won't be the product, which is obviously not the case, right? Apple, Apple doesn't need to charge Fortnite a 30% commission to keep you safe. Apple charges Fortnite a 30% commission because the only way Fortnite can reach you is by Apple selling you to them. You are the product for Apple, right? But then, then uh, Corey, but the, the, how do we deal with uh, competition authorities in this yeah. context? Because I, yeah. I think that is the, the main issue. For example, we have a law here in Argentina on competition, and it's the first time in history, I see it uh, being applied against WhatsApp, uh, new terms of use. Uh, they started an investigation here, but it's just a little thing that we can do here in Brazil, in Chile, in Argentina, in a thousand count, uh, without something really serious from the North. Uh, so the changes, the changes in the perspective on competition in the, in the last decades in the US has and a huge impact in the whole world. I, I completely agree. I mean, this is a problem of America's making in, in more than one regard. So, to, you know, to understand here what's happened with monopoly enforcement, competition enforcement, uh, it was pretty lax. There was, a, there was a brief flurry of competition enforcement in the late 19th century, mostly about farmers and mostly about farmers who, who weren't worried about selling power, but about buying power which is a really important area of competition law, because buying power is where you see Amazon crushing both its workforce and its suppliers, uh, you know, whether those are publishers or writers or what have you. The wage theft story is a buyer power story. So, you know, Proposition 22 in California, which institutionalized worker misclassification, uh, that's a buyer power issue. And uh, competition law lay dormant until uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal, and then it came back, and it came back with a very muscular definition of why we would enforce competition law. And the, the competition law in, in America was enforced against abusive dominance. The idea that unaccountable power had been gathered into a small number of hands, and that however benevolent the dictator claimed to be, that the, that lack of accountability would always end up hurting someone, because there was always someone for whom a fair outcome would be uh, dispreferred by the person who had accumulated all that power and answered to no one. And for decades, that was how US antitrust law was enforced. And when the US restructured European law after World War II, that was how European anti antitrust law or competition law was established. And things sort of puttered along for about 40 years. And there was, um, or 30 years rather, well, 40 years. And there was, there was this presumption that any time an industry was dominated by the same firms for more than a few years at a time, that those firms were probably up to no good and there were um, investigations opened into them just on the basis that the number one company had been number one for a decade, right? And that you should just probably look into that because that doesn't seem the way, that, that doesn't look like a market to, to the regulator. And starting in the Reagan years, we changed the basis for enforcement and we exported it around the world again. And the new basis for enforcement was not about harmful dominance, but about consumer welfare. And consumer welfare was, was defined in this very narrow way. We said that we should only enforce against a monopoly when you can prove 
that the monopoly is going to make prices go up. And that may sound on its face to seem a little reasonable. No one wants to pay higher prices, but there's two things to realize about this. First, and I think the most important thing about it is that there are a lot of bad things that monopolies do that don't involve making prices go up, right? That they, they maim and kill their workers, right? They, they pollute uh, uh, their environment and sicken the people who live near their facilities. They distort policy by bribing or coercing or bullying lawmakers and creating outcomes that are bad for everyone else and good for them. So that's, that's I think, the most important reason that that was inadequate. But there's another reason that it's inadequate that I want to bring up because it's under its own terms, it fails, which is that the way that the Chicago School and Robert Bork were the architects of this consumer welfare standard, the way that they wanted to uh, assess whether or not a consumer welfare har farm harm would happen or had happened was by building these mathematical models. And happily for them, the only people who knew how to build and interpret these models was them. And so what would happen is if you wanted to do a merger, you would summon one of them and you would give him a handsome sum of money and he would build you a mathematical model and he would interpret the model and he would say, the model says it's fine. <laughs> there will be no <laughs> consumer welfare harms. And then if you bought a, a, your big rival and you put prices up and a decade went by, and the lawmaker came back to you, the regulator came back to you, you'd hire another one of these Chicago school economists and they would build you another model. And they would say, the model tells us that the prices didn't go up because of monopoly. There's not, nothing to see here, folks, move along. So <laughs> it's like the models they, on intellectual property, Corey. <laughs> it's, it's exactly <laughs> like it. And, and here's the important thing, right? Is they converted an area where the harms were about harms to the, um, the, dem the demos where everyone had a reason to, uh, to, to have some input, where everyone had standing to talk about what was happening to their world. And it turned it into an area where only people who could build models got to have a say. So those people became kind of a court sorcerer. And whenever the king said, I have a plan for my empire, the court sorcerer would drag a goat into the court and cut the goat open and spread its, goats, its guts out on the floor. And they would say, the goat says the king is right. And then if someone were to have the temerity to say, I've looked at the guts and I don't see what you're telling me, they go, look who thinks he can interpret the guts of a goat, right? This guy never went to the University of Chicago. So <laughs> we go from this area where we are constituted as citizens to one where we're constituted as consumers and consumers vote with their wallets. And the more money you have, the more votes you get, right? The thicker your wallet is, the more votes you get. And of course, every worker is a consumer and every consumer, except for a very small number, investors are workers. And so if we exempt the harms to workers from the harms to consumers, it means that the only people who actually benefit universally from a consumer welfare standard are the people who don't have to work, right? The people who own things for a living, not the people who do things for a living. And but so- But this is actually for, killing innovation. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, so for sure. And then now let's get into interoperability because that's where, that's where it starts to get really um, sticky. So in the same period, the technology industry was growing up. Ronald Reagan hit the campaign trail in 1979. The Apple II Plus launched in 1979. So these two industries, the dismantling antitrust industry and the tech industry, they grew together, right? They were they're wrapped around each other. And in the early days of tech, you may recall, it felt very dynamic. One day, everyone had a Cray supercomputer. It was what we all aspired to. The next day, Silicon Graphics, this company that had just appeared out of nowhere, bought it. The day after that, Silicon Graphics was bankrupt because people were doing rendering on Sun workstations and then Linux stations built on commodity hardware, right? One company would, be, would, would rise to the top and then be collapsed by a new market entrant. IBM couldn't make its own operating system. It got two guys you know, from Seattle to build them an operating system. Um, then, you know, along came uh, uh, Alta Vista only to be toppled by, by Google. And, you know, it just felt like things were always on the, on the move. And when you look at how each one of these firms grew to dominance, what you see is they all did something important with interoperability, which is that they, interrupt, they interoperated in the most rude and inconsiderate way. So when Microsoft wouldn't make a good client for, for, uh, for the Mac, for Windows, or for Word rather, and for Excel and for the other Office suite programs, 
Steve Jobs didn't ask Bill Gates nicely to make him a good program. He just reverse engineered it, or he paid someone who understood computers to reverse engineer it, one of his engineers, and then made a product called iWork Suite, which he then launched along with a campaign called Switch. And when people talk about tech monopolies, they say, oh, well, they're monopolies because they have network effects. Every time someone makes a new Word document, that's a reason to get Office, right? And if it's a reason to get Office, it's a reason to get Windows. But network effects aren't nearly so important as switching costs. The reason that we care about the network effect of Microsoft Office documents all over the world is that it's very hard to stay in touch with those Microsoft Office users if you don't have a way to read and write their files. That's well, that's, the that's been the, the problem with uh, a lot of people that I, I've been a user of free software since 20 years now. At the beginning mm -hmm. of the free software movement, we have this, all these this concepts of oh, we need inter open standards, interoperability. Uh, and, and then uh, it, it's like uh, suddenly nobody else is, is claiming this, uh, is reclaiming this right. Uh, uh, or at least there is a, just a few communities claiming the right uh, to repair or the right to do um, uh, 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 this, uh, this um, how, uh, I, I, sorry, I lost the, the word, but there is reversal engineering, the, uh, oh, reversal, reversal engineering. engineering, it's okay, reversal engineering. And, but what are the, uh, the, the most worried uh, things, uh, regulations that we have to face in, in case we have to promote adversarial interoperability, which is sure. the regulation that is blocking it now. It's its intellectual property as well, or, or do we, it's the, the CFAA. Uh, so where do we have to put our, our uh, views, our, our attention? Yeah. So the, the early days of the free software movement, you know, they, they had two claims, right? The two, two goals. One was to create open standards so that everybody would do everything in a way that made it easy to interoperate. But the other was in those cases where there was no open standard to just go ahead and do it, right? Just just like, oh, you don't like Flash being proprietary? Reverse engineer Flash and make a Flash runtime, right? We're at this adversarial interoperability. And it was, you know, it was a very kind of guerrilla tactic, but it wasn't distinct to the free software world. As, as I said, this is what, Apple did to Microsoft. It's what Facebook did to MySpace. It's, you know, every uh, new market entrant has done this to reduce the switching costs of the incumbent and neutralize their network effects. And the free software movement focused its attention for a long time on closed and open. This, this stuff we have to reverse engineer, this stuff we can just implement, right? That was the, that was the twin poles. And the thing was that their spectrum, as it turned out, was very, was too narrow because here you have open, which is takes less work, and here you have closed, which takes more work. But what they were ignoring was that there was a third category de 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 devouring all the other uh, software categories, which was if you try to reverse engineer this, if you try to do the work, they'll put you in prison. Yeah. And that's the stuff that's covered, as you say, by intellectual property laws. And free software people hate the term intellectual property. Right? Yes, they say, oh, I am so one big. of those haters. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say, oh, it's not property. Plus, are you talking about a trademark or a copyright or a patent or a trade secret or a term of service or a non-compete agreement or a sui generis neighboring right or whatever? Which one is it? And here's the thing that I think we, we didn't understand, is that when business uses the term intellectual property, it's not a meaningless buzzword. It actually has an incredibly precise definition. When a corporate officer says, what intellectual property do you have? What IP do you have? What they mean is, what rules or regulations can you avail yourself of that will allow you to reach out and control the conduct of your competitors, your critics, and your customers? Right? And they don't care. That's why, that's why they don't distinguish. Right? They don't care if it's a trademark or a trade secret or this or that, right? What they care about is not the notional goals of different IP regimes, disclosure of patentable inventions or uh, incentive to create in a copyright or whatever. What they care about is control. And so yes. they fashion these overlapping layers where you have a copyright and then the copyright has some limitations and exceptions, but those limitations and exceptions are covered by a patent, which has some limitations and exceptions, which are covered by a trademark, which has some limitations and exceptions, which are covered by a trade secret. And so the idea is to build up 
a suite of controls that allow you to reach outside of the boundary of the enterprise and decide what other enterprises can do, what, what customers can do. Can, can you make a third-party ink cartridge? Can you use a third-party ink cartridge? Can you analyze a first-party ink cartridge and describe how a third-party ink cartridge is made? All of those involve some measure of trademark, trade secrecy, patents, uh, uh, anti-circumvention, and other rules. And the idea is to wrap them all up so that you can you can control them and so you know when you look at these international trade agreements like TPP and TTIA and so on one of the things that that we see is that their IP chapters are always written with this in mind that that's that's the way they're structured is not to protect legitimate interests and not to protect the rule of law but to conjure up a thing that uh, um, uh, the Sorek, the guy who's, who started Cydia, the uh, third-party Apple store, he calls it felony contempt of business model, right? What every firm has dreamt of since the earliest days of market economies is the ability to, just, to decide what the market would do. And this is what Zuboff is afraid of. Yeah. Zuboff is afraid that a firm will be able to decide how you use its products. But she's afraid that they'll be able to decide how you use its products by bypassing your critical faculties. They don't have to do that, right? They just have to use DRM. And yes. that's the problem with her analysis, is that yes. not that she's wrong to be afraid that firms can control our conduct, but that she's wrong to under-theorize the role that uh, IP law, that competition law plays, and to over-theorize the outlandish claims of, of you know, self-described mind controllers. And so the way that we got to this policy regime where we have these terrible rules, this, you know, an expansion of patents and copyrights and so on, is because monopolies that used to violate those terms were able to expand them once they no longer needed them. They were able to kick the ladder away. Every pirate wants to be an admiral. And, and there is a, a huge responsibility from the WTO in expanding this agenda all over the world because uh, most of our countries had to change their laws. They, they, the rest of the world had to change their laws because of the interest of this big pharma interest, the, the big media, the big uh, entertainment industry. And I would like to, especially considering that we are having this remote rights come um, and that we are uh, going through uh, one of the worst nightmares in, 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 in the life of humanity, that we are uh, in the middle of a pandemic that is uh, impacting us, uh, really hard, especially in the southern uh, countries like Latin America. Uh, I would like to ask you if you are following the WTO negotiation on the waiver. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen that there was uh, in, in, in the last hours a complaint from the industry, the enter entertainment industry, saying that if they approve the waiver, uh, they will affect the artists and, and the writers and the, and, the, and all the people. And I saw your signature in a declaration from the artist saying, not in my name. So um, um, what is your your view on this? Do you think that uh, this, uh, this um, waiver on intellectual property within the WTO will be, uh, will succeed, that the, the, the pressure from the South will succeed? Uh, and what's your opinion on the changes in the, in the Biden administration uh, and supporting this, uh, the, the waiver? Well, yeah. The, the Biden administration's statements so far, the, the USTR statements so far, although they fall short of the mark, are also nothing short of miraculous. I, I as you say, I've been around this stuff for 20 years. Uh, I would have bet a kidney that I would not <laughs> live to hear the US trade representative back a waiver. But of course, it's the right thing to do. Um, so look. <laughs> I don't want to sound smug here. I live in California. I'm fully vaccinated. My whole family is fully vaccinated. Um, we went to the movie theater this weekend, right? The movie was terrible, but it was great, right? We are well because we have access to vaccines. And the story of not allowing people in the global south to make their own vaccines and insisting that they line up for the doses that are left over after people like me get vaccinated 
it's i mean on its face it's it's a disgusting humanitarian disaster right it is it is a howling moral void to say wait your turn until your social betters and you know if it were me and my child who was not vaccinated whose life was put to risk over this i would be incandescent and inconsolable i would never ever ever trust the system again if that were the case and the story that they tell us is that the global south has to wait their turn not just because uh, businesses deserve to get paid but also because poor brown people are too stupid to make vaccines right and that is that that's the foundational claim here uh and this ignores some pretty important issues, like the largest vaccine factories in the world are in the global south. And when you actually dig into it, what you find is that the closest thing to a credible claim that they have is that we have a, a input shortage, right? That we can't get the stuff that we need to make vaccines fast enough. And if we let poor brown people make their own vaccines, rich white people wouldn't be able to get vaccinated. Now. I think that that's oversold and overstated. I mean, if we think that we can eventually get enough material inputs to produce vaccines for everyone, then really what we're just talking about is some logistical hurdles. But even if not, why on earth are we entitled to, to get to the front of the line when people in the global south aren't? Now, that's the, that's the sound ethical argument for it. But there's also a purely utilitarian argument for it, which is that every person who gets the virus becomes a factory that produces the virus by the billions, right? And every time you reproduce the virus, there's a small chance of mutation. And every mutation has a small chance of becoming more virulent. And every virulent, more virulent mutation has a small chance of becoming vaccine resistant. And we're risking the whole goddamn planet, the species, our civilization, in the name of allowing firms to commercialize public research. Now the WTO, its basis was, the, the pact that it made with the Global South was, every rich country in the world ignored intellectual property until it was rich, but you're not gonna do that. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to dream up ideas lying here in our hammocks, and we will send those ideas to you and your factories. And then by turning our ideas into products, you will learn how to have cool ideas like us, and then you will be able to do what we do and lie in a hammock too. But if it ever comes up that there's a horrible pandemic and everyone's life is at risk and maybe your kids are gonna die, of course we'll stop insisting on this thing and we'll let you make your own vaccines. That was the promise. That's how the WTO was structured. That's why there's room for a waiver. And if there was ever a moment at which the WTO waiver process needed to be invoked, it's this moment. Now, the fact that the IP industry, the, the so-called creative industries, have come out against this tells you that it's not about business, it's about ideology, right? It's about yes. this idea that, that um, you should be able to lie in a hammock and come up with ideas and get someone else to pay you for them. And moreover, that if you can structure the market so that the people who come up with the ideas have to sell those ideas to people who work in fancy office buildings so that they can lie in hammocks, and get someone else to pay them for them, then that is the way, that is the natural order of things. And um, the thing that the WTO waiver challenges is that idea, that idea of the justice of alienable intellectual property, uh, that, that ideas should be owned and alienable and that labor markets can be concentrated so that everyone who owns an intellectual property right can be alienated of it instantaneously by a monopolistic firm that also has a monopsony and controls access to the, to the uh, commercial market and then can uh, accrue not just a monopoly in name, right? Uh, the, the monopoly in terms of market power, but also these authors monopolies, these creative monopolies and confuse them together to make this very durable monopoly where instead of risking antitrust enforcement by doing things to defend a market power monopoly, instead they just defend their patents, defend their copyrights. And that is not something any competition authority in the world is gonna prosecute. And so um, that is the thing that they're worried about, right? They're worried about the, the crumbling of this, this perfect edifice of the market monopoly fused with the author's monopoly that is, uh, in unassailable by any law or power.
In, in fact, uh, now that you mentioned that uh, the issue is controlling um, the, 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 the dissemination of knowledge, uh, let me tell you that we faced here in, in Argentina, we, we have one of the worst intellectual property laws in the world, no, almost no exceptions and limitations. We, for example, I'm also a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and we cannot do copies for research or for uh, um, our students. And in last year, when we went to the remote uh, uh, classes, we are still in remote classes, and, and a lot of uh, kids didn't go to school, in, in they had remote classes. We had to violate the law. We had to yeah. be, and, and, and we published a lot of articles saying it, this is a matter of justice. It's not that we are thieves. It's not that we want to steal things from authors. Uh, it's just a matter of justice. We cannot uh, leave these people behind. We need to have the materials, the, the, all the books that children needed for the school and the the uh, and and all the materials for the researchers. So. Um, before uh, we are already receiving some questions from the audience, uh, okay. but I, I would like to ask you just a short uh, opinion, your first view on this uh, uh, announcement from the G7 countries on taxes, the the big tech, and this 15% uh, levy that they are uh, talking about. In in we consider it it's uh, necessary but not enough. But I would like to hear from yeah. you uh, just a, a, a short view on that. I mean, I would say that that the the best place to look for informed commentary on this is the Tax Justice Network and Nick Shaxson. Uh, and their take on it was that it is too low. Uh, Gabriel Zuckman said it was too low. He said that it should have been 25%. He also points out that countries can make it 25%, 15% is the floor, not the ceiling. But it's also structured in such a way that while it will um, help the rich countries where large firms are headquartered, it's not going to help the poor countries where they, where they operate. And so it, it's it's likely to exacerbate inequality, which is not a reason to get rid of it. It's a reason to make it broader. Yes, <laughs> I totally agree. Well, I, I, um, we have re we are, have a few questions from the audience, mm -hmm. so I will read uh, from Adrian. Uh, it's a bit wired to criticize surveillance capitalism. This this question was posed in the, at the beginning of our conversation, so it, it refers to the the, the criticizer of surveillance capitalism while not addressing capitalism as a whole. In the surveillance capitalism problem, mostly uh, is the surveillance capitalism problem mostly a surveillance problem or a capitalism problem? Okay, so I think it's both in the sense that surveillance is bad, right? Surveillance is bad because you can't be your authentic self under surveillance and it helps autocratic regimes identify and neutralize their critics and it uh, um, abets uh, criminals and harassers and so on. So there are all kinds of reasons that surveillance is bad. Um, but I also think that the reason we have so much forbearance of surveillance, right? The reason that something that is so obviously harmful can take place with impunity is that we have monopolies, right? Is that is that markets without uh, strong regulation to prevent mergers to monopoly and predatory acquisitions and predatory conduct will over time produce monopolies and those monopolies will suborn their regulators and they'll get to do obviously harmful things. I don't think that we should abolish all markets. I just think that markets should be viewed as a tool. You know, there's, there's um, uh, an economist, he calls himself the cowboy economist. He teaches in Texas and he, he does this shtick where he puts on a cowboy hat and a big belt buckle and talks about economics on YouTube. And, and he, his name's John T. Harvey. And he says, uh, being someone who thinks that if you can't do it, if you can't do it with a market, you shouldn't do it. It's like being a carpenter who only believes in screwdrivers. And someone comes along and says, I need you to nail these two boards together. And you say, look, buddy, no one but a communist would use a hammer and nails. I'm a screwdriver man. And if these two boards can't be held together with a screw, then they shouldn't be held together, right? There are things that markets can allocate well. Um, market, but markets are a tool for allocation. They're not the only way we can allocate. And planning is important too, uh, and uh, as is regulation. And you know, even the, the, the most uh, vicious robber baron doesn't run their company like a market, right? Like when you go to work at Amazon, you don't put like bids and puts on which desk you're going to sit in. You know, Commissar Bezos 
has had his has had his uh, his sub commissars assign you a work assignment according to their five year plan, right? And as Yochai Bankler points out, if you go down to uh, Wall Street and you go to a playground where the stockbrokers have their toddlers playing, and the these these people who claim greed is good and who's can't read their copies of Ayn Rand anymore because the pages are all stuck together. You know, when they see their kids playing badly in the playground, they shout, Billy, share! <laughs> because everybody knows that it's a shuck, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that, that that idea that greed is Pareto optimal is, <laughs> is BS and that, yeah. you know, you don't want to you don't want to live or work <laughs> with people who act that way. And so, yeah, I mean, sure, let's have markets where we need markets, right? Fine. But but let's not assume that if we can't do it with a market, we shouldn't do it at all. Okay. We have just five minutes left and we have two questions coming from the audience. So I, I uh, put it very, very quickly. Uh, do you see a connection, David says, do you see a connection between adversarial interoperability applied to web services and restrictions on bots originating in broad interpretation of the CFAA, especially surrounding the question of circumvention? Yeah, 100%. So I, I call it the thicket. Right. So the, the the what the CFAA does, like DMC 1201, which is the anti-circumvention rule, which is in most countries in its own guise, like in Europe, it's Article six of the EUCD. Um, what they say is if you if you configure your product so that using it in ways that benefit you instead of the shareholder requires hopping over a fence, right, violating a term of service, removing a TPM, then the, the conduct that is otherwise lawful but disfavored by the shareholders becomes unlawful. And so when you say to people, all you need to do to make it illegal to frustrate your commercial plans is to prohibit the conduct that you disfavor in your terms of service, then um, they will then structure their terms of service so that everything that would benefit you at their cost, anything that would shift value from their side of the ledger to your side of the ledger as a user or a customer or a competitor is violated by their terms of service and therefore a violation of the CFAA and therefore a felony. So absolutely the CFAA is involved with this, but it's not just the CFAA because we, we still have section 121 of the DMCA and there are some important legal questions right now in play with that where Facebook, for example, has argued that there's a 1201 violation by New York University in their ad observer project, which scrapes ads uh, and checks to see whether they comply with Facebook's political disinformation policies. And Facebook says that there's a DMCA violation in uh, in scraping the ads, a DMCA 1201 violation. Oh, no, I beg your pardon. They say it's a CFAA violation. Mm. YouTube says that YouTube DL, which is a YouTube downloading tool, is a 1201 violation. But it, in both cases, we have large firms that are, that are seeking to use uh, these very broad laws to literally criminalize doing things that their shareholders wish you wouldn't do, which would otherwise be legal, except for the way that they've deployed some technical aspect of their service. And we are running out of time. So I, I just uh, put Valeria's question. I believe that very notion of open and openness need to still be claimed in their current implications. And I'm concerned about how capitalism and the IP regime have also co-opted the terms and their notion. What counter narrative uh, we, yeah. it, it, the question is for both of us, feel we need to embrace in our advocacy for regulations currently and in the post-pandemic scenario. And this will be our last minute uh, right. remarks. Well, so. I know how I'd answer it, but I'd like to hear your answer. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then I'll yeah, tell this... you mine. <laughs> I, oh, no, unless, go ahead. No, I, I mean, oh. the counter narrative is, is, is uh, it's a key issue uh, that is very, very hard to build, but uh, we have to claim justice uh, and we have to stop uh, speaking the language of the those who want to dominate our narrative. Yeah, I would I, I was very influenced in this by Benjamin Mako Hill's 2018 Libre Planet keynote on open versus free. And he said, yes. you know, we called it free software. And then they said, you need to call it open because it's scaring people. And he said that by stressing the, the utilitarian benefits of openness, right, code auditing and so on, what we got was open source for all of us and freedom for monopolists. So Google has software freedom. They can deploy software in any way they want. 
we have open source. We can see the, so the code for their backend. We can submit patches to it and so on. But because all of our apps loop through their cloud and they have a veto over their cloud, how their cloud works, we got openness and they got freedom. And so it follows that we just need to take back freedom, right? We yes. need to take back software freedom, technological self-determination, right? It's not enough to be able to see the code. You have to be able to use the code to realize your life the way you want to live it. So free software for everyone. So it was a pleasure, a big pleasure for me Likewise. to share this. <laughs> So this is, we have reached the end. We have no more time. So thank you, Corey, and thank you, uh, the audience and all the uh, technical team at Writecom. Yeah, thanks everyone uh, at Writescon. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next few days. Thank you, Beatrice. I hope we get bye to meet bye. together soon. I hope so.